Hello and welcome to Cross City Church. We're excited that you're here and that you're setting aside some time to worship with your Cross City family. When you join us online, you're a part of a community of people worshiping together, and we don't ever want to forget that. We are the church, not any physical place or building, and we're honored that you would join us today. As we worship together, we'll remember how incredible God's grace and forgiveness are and how we can live our lives in victory. Let's start with asking him to help us to see him in a new way and to let his word shape our lives. Father, this morning, we ask that you renew us, that you change us by the power of your word. Allow us the privilege of leaving this place, this experience different and changed because of you. In your name we pray this, amen. Good morning, Cross City. We're so excited to worship with you this morning. Hebrews 4, so let us come boldly before the throne of our gracious God. So let's do that this morning and offer him all of our praise. Amen. Amen. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above. Shakes the whole earth with holy. 
all that you do for us. Father, we thank you for your blessings that you pour on us. We thank you for your ultimate sacrifice. Father, we thank you that by your blood, we are washed clean, we are healed. It's only through your name. That's why we sing this this morning. That's why we praise your name. By his stripes, we are healed. By his nail-pierced hands, we're free. By his blood, we're washed clean.
Thanks for joining us at Cross City Church, where we're all about real people finding real hope and experiencing real life in Christ. If you're watching for the very first time, we're really glad you're here, and we'd love to get to know you. Visit crosscity.church slash guest to hear a message from our pastor and to let us know you're with us. Get a little alone time with your spouse at our drive-in date night. We'll provide childcare, dinner from food trucks, and a movie, all for only $20 per couple. It's on October 30th at 6.30 p.m. on the Euless campus, and you can get more information at crosscity.church slash date night. Next week, we're going live. Our 11 a.m. service will be broadcast from our worship center, and you can catch the worship, preaching, and everything else as it happens. We'll modify our online schedule and replace our 9 and 10 a.m. services with the one live service at 11 a.m. So join us next week in person at any of our services or live online at crosscity.church slash live. The people of Cross City are what make ministry possible. Not only do we have hundreds who volunteer their time, but so many people give to support the mission of our church, which is to lead all people to follow Jesus. You can give at crosscity.church slash give or by texting the words Cross City to 77977. Today's political climate is as complex as it's ever been, and the pandemic has made it even more difficult. Today, we'll look at the challenges ahead in this election season through the lens of scripture. Don't forget that you can follow along with the message and get links at everything we've discussed at crosscity.church slash notes. Now let's welcome Pastor John Metter. Hi, this is Pastor John Metter at Cross City Church, and I wanna thank you for joining us each week with our Cross City Online. And uh, of course, we are meeting uh, on our campuses at all of our venues at all of our normal times as well. <clears throat> and we are delighted to see an increasing number of people come, even to the small groups that happen at 930s and uh, at the main campus. But we also uh, are for continuing to uh, bring our online messaging to you. Now, next week, there will be a change in that our online messaging will be live. It'll be from the room uh, at 11 a.m. And that'll, ha- that'll be how we do it going forward. Uh, but in the past, we've done a 9, a 10, 11 o'clock. Uh, that same messaging is still available to you, but just at 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings from this point forward. Thank you so much uh, for joining with us. This is actually a very unusual message I'm bringing today. Uh, the title of the message is, What Will We Embrace? And if you have your Bibles, take the text uh, where we've been going. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25 is where I'll start reading in just a few moments. But before I dive into this, let me just uh, let me let you know that as we talk about the important events leading up to the election uh, that we have before us, uh, I'm going to be speaking from a table. I'm going to be speaking as a father speaks to uh, his family. Uh, I have six children. They're they're from age 23 to age 38. We have these conversations all the time about how biblical values impact what we do in our culture, how how it impacts what we do uh, in the government. Uh, and what our beliefs are, what our thoughts are about that. So I, I know how to have these kind of conversations. We have a lot of them. And, uh, but today I'll be somewhat brief, uh, but at the same time try to point out some things that are very important. More or less ask questions about how we're viewing things as we move towards the election. This will be the one message in which I address this, and then we'll get back into our series that we're kicking off next week that we'll be excited about as well. I'm always surprised, though I shouldn't be, at the timing of certain key events and how they fall into the place where we've been in our preaching emphasis. So this is October 11th, 2020, which means that we're nearing the end of an unprecedented year, just 23 days away from a general election and one in which we'll select the president for the next four years. So it's an important time and it's an important talk. But look where we've been in our Sunday morning preaching schedule that was formed without regard to an election. We've been walking through the book of 1 Corinthians, dealing with the general subject of Jesus, church, and culture, with a view that we exercise the kingdom of God in the context of everyday culture by allowing Jesus to live through us. Next week, I'll kick off another series, as I've said, in our continuation of 1 Corinthians, which will be called, What is Truth? How do we know what the truth is? And Paul will tell us that truth isn't determined by the rulers of the world, but predetermined by the God of the universe. In a very pointed way, our behavior in this election can allow us to represent Jesus and culture and truth in culture. It's the call of the church. Uh, no one else can really do it except believers. So let's go to 1 Corinthians. Let me read this verse uh, or two, and let's get back into what we're facing this year. Verse uh, 25 
of chapter 1 says this. And we've already covered this in our study, but we're bringing it back up. He says, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. He's giving the argument that the world has its way of thinking wisdom exists, but God has an entirely different wisdom that's greater than that of the world. And then in verse 6 of chapter 2, which we'll pick up next week and walk through, Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of the age who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So while it's next week that we dive into this text with a much closer examination as it relates to truth, I want to look ahead and urge you to know this. We are to always speak God's truths, and we will often be misunderstood. That's just the nature of the conflict between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man. And nowhere is it more evident than a time like this. And that's always going to be the case. But for us, I want what I said last week about Jesus, church, and culture, and what I say next week about the origin of truth to be consistent with what's said today. We can't turn on and off biblical convictions, though many do. It's a conviction that's a deep-seated belief that's based in Scripture. That's what conviction is. Uh, One leader said this. He said, My personal convictions should be guided by the Bible, not by culture or convenience, and most certainly not by theories of others which are in conflict with the Holy Scriptures. Ronnie Floyd said that. I wholeheartedly agree. It's in the arrival of convictions which may be more difficult to place in context that we struggle. We love the Bible. We believe the truth. But sometimes it's hard to place what we see in the Bible in the current context. And we're concerned about some things that are difficult to find played out in government and are best left to the ministry of the church. So we have this dynamic tension going on. Here are, however, some things that we are to clearly do as Christians living in a non-Christian world. But let me give you several principles that are important. Number one, we must immerse this season with prayer. We must do that. One of the clearest passages of the Bible as it relates to Christians and culture and Christians regarding government is in 1 Timothy chapter 2, where Paul says to the church, First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may live a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. So we kick all this off with prayer, and specifically with prayer for leaders who will allow us to have the freedom of worship and the freedom of religion. Now, Paul didn't always have that in his day, that freedom. But it's a big ask for every generation. It's incredibly important. By the way, we don't spend much time on elections and political matters at Cross City. I rarely preach on this, but I have preached exactly four times in my 14 years on an election issue. Why not more? Quite simply, we have more important things to do. Win people to Christ, baptize them, disciple them, send them out. Politics can't change hearts, but Jesus can. But we do care about who leads our nation in terms of governmental leaders. And we do want to help our country make the best choice. And we do want this to happen while we remain united around the absolute priorities of the gospel. So, Prayer has a lot to do with it. Pray for our church. Pray for the the church of Jesus Christ across America during this time. Pray for the process itself. It's really a big deal for us. So we pray for kings and all those in authority. Then number two, engage this decision on platform. Here's what Paul said to the church at Thessalonica. He said, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Paul told the young church at Thessalonica to live out their faith in a lost world and to be careful with what they embraced. The wording is intentional. To retain, to hold down, to embrace that which is good. So what's good? Good is what God calls good. Good is what God says to pursue. But Paul goes even further with the word abstain and says you must move away from that which is every form of evil. So we can't pronounce as good what God calls evil. So how do we as believers arrive at what is good? How do we arrive at the truth? One word, the scriptures. I fear our lack of discipleship has hurt us in this area in the church across America. It's evident in the very wide diversity about what people believe, about doctrine, about morals, also about values that come into play at a time like this. One leader made this insightful observation. 
He said, I do not think people realize at all the degree to which they're not just being informed by media sources, but being formed by them. It's not just information. It's a form of discipleship. Josh Haverton said that. It's something for thinking about. Thinking about. While there are disagreements on many issues in our communities and nation, influenced by the media and social media, those are only pushing us further away from each other. Let's make sure we engage in election through the lens of Scripture. Now, truth should bring us together. Let's work hard to make that happen. And the way we do that is to put on our biblical worldview and understanding of biblical truths and then compare it to the stated objectives of a political party. And that's sometimes a very involved process. It does take some research. Now, where does the word platform come in? The party platform is a stated set of principles that an elected representative aligns with, like a doctrinal statement. It defines a church's beliefs and convictions. The party platform defines a party's beliefs. Important stat. More than three-fourths of the time in history, 75% of the time or more, elected officials will follow the full platform of the party. It's virtually assured that those candidates will embrace their platforms. In fact, most of the election choices we have, and I know you'll know this is true, year in and year out, are names of people we know little about. Sometimes no more than their names. Some are more visible, obviously not the presidential candidates, but most are not. The only way you can know their stance is to know their platforms that they stand on. And we don't wisely vote on personalities and looks and popularities. Appearance is only skin deep. So here's a question. Do you know the platforms? Read the contract. We always do. When we purchase a house, we purchase something else, we, we read the contract. We read the fine print. And we should read party platforms carefully before we cast a vote because basically we're embracing a certain philosophy uh, political direction. By the way, we have provided some nonpartisan comparisons of platforms at our Guest Central so that you can take when you leave today if you're in our services. Um, you'll find those all over the internet if you make a, a real quick Google search. Just type in comparison of party platform and you'll see those comparisons aligned on your screen. Someone might say, but Pastor, does any platform equally embrace scripture priorities with all the issues? The answer is no. They don't, not completely. So what helps here? Well, let's face something. An election is not a shopping trip where you can get everything you want for yourself or for others. It's not a popularity contest between candidates. Elections are times when you can demonstrate kingdom values in an otherwise secular world. It's an incredible opportunity, an amazing privilege to do this. That's why I encourage every Christian to vote. Every citizen should vote. What helps is to ask yourself questions that can bring one to the place of voting with a biblical value and a clear conscience on every level of government. So I'm going to ask a few questions about platforms and voting for just a few moments. First question is this. How will my vote reflect the biblical value of the unborn? Now I start here because it's obviously a weighty issue for lots of reasons. We all want a higher quality of life. That's a preference for us, though, not a moral issue. Life and death is a moral issue, as we're called to protect life. Here's what helps me. Some platform issues are deal breakers. As one man put it, I would never embrace an avowed, proven racist. I could never vote for a person like that. Or I wouldn't vote for a man who's a God-hater, an admitted atheist. Thankfully, none of our choices are that. Those would be deal breakers. Something else has been a deal breaker for many believers, and that's the issue of abortion. I don't know one follower of Christ who does not anguish over the issue of abortion, and for good reason. I can never knowingly help place into office a person who promotes the legalization of abortion. I would not vote at all if that were the case. But the party platforms make this issue clear to the public. It's unavoidable, and it's really more publicly visible than almost most any other issue. So while this is clearly a moral issue, the stances of the party have elevated this to be a party priority or a political issue. Recently, a statement has been circulated widely that says this, pro-life is not simply anti-abortion. Now, let me just say, I completely agree with that statement. However, I don't think it goes far enough. It's vague, just vague enough to cast doubt on the importance of the value of the unborn. And anything that casts doubt on what the Bible makes clear needs more clarity, so let's clarify. Pro-life is more than caring about life inside the womb, but it is in no way less than caring about the unborn. So how is it evident you care about life outside the womb if you don't care about life inside the womb? Proverbs tells us this, open your mouth for the mute, 
for the rights of all the unfortunate. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the afflicted and needy. Proverbs 31, 8 and 9. So we're to care for the lives of all, beginning at conception. Of all people in America, the Church of Jesus should understand this best. We should be pro-birth, pro-parent, pro-children, pro-family, and right on through every stage of life. Actually, we organize our church this way. We're not only pro-life at birth, we're pro-life at adoption for those who choose it. Did you know that Christians are twice as likely to have adopted than non-Christians? Because the Bible always lands squarely in the favor of the orphan and the widow as being precious in the sight of God. So value the unborn, then value the born. Don't let the weariness in the battle for the unborn keep you from placing at the top tier of importance. Of course it's worrying, and of course it's a tough battle, but it's a battle we cannot ignore or give in to. That's the first question. The second one is key as well. How will my vote reflect the biblical value of religious freedom? Because we have religious freedom, that is the freedom to worship and then the freedom to practice and share our faith, this is about protecting what's been given to us here in America. Listen, I will tell you, we are blessed to have this, and nothing and no one should be allowed to threaten it. That's why we're constantly praying for kings and all those who are in authority. And as Paul said, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. That's a prayer that we mentioned earlier. The free exercise of religion gives us the opportunity to share the gospel with more and more people, to help people, to feed people, to clothe people, to give them backpacks, to do all the things that we do in our community. So our candidates and party platforms faith-friendly? Or are they faith restrictive? My personal belief in worst case scenario is that if America were taken over by some unexpected ideology that greatly restricted our freedom of religion, the church would still thrive because it's not dependent upon government, but upon God himself. That's an encouraging fact that's been proven over and over in Old Testament narrative, in the book of Acts, and in history. At the same time in America, we should never give up the religious freedom so many have sacrificed for us to have. So it'll always be an important issue. There's a third question I would ask, and that is, how will my vote reflect justice issues? There may be no other topic that's receiving as much attention today as justice issues. And the clear answer here is the plumb line of Scripture. Micah 6 8 calls us to justice. He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Christians are always to pursue justice. Justice involves both the protecting of the innocent, no matter who they are, and the punishment of the guilty, no matter who they are. No society thrives without those two priorities. When Scripture speaks to Israel about governing local communities, we see great principles at work. You shall appoint for yourselves judges and officers in all your towns, which the Lord your God is giving you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not distort judgment. You should not be partial. You should not take a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and perverts the words of the righteous. Justice and only justice you shall pursue so that you may live and possess the land which the Lord your God has given you. It's obvious that we must call for justice at all times. It's also clear that we appoint people in our community to administer it. And in the present day, these are our called our police officers, our judges, and our elective officials. It's an important local matter for us all. And I emphasize the word local because we have more impact by being involved at the local matter than any other way. So we should be concerned about these things. But we don't have to choose between black lives and blue lives in pursuing justice. No one's going to make me choose between the two. I have a deep and abiding respect for people of all colors. We're in the same family. I also have a deep respect for police officers, judges, and officials, and I appreciate their perspective as well. We need them badly for civil order and justice. We all work together locally to make it happen. Party platforms address this, but the real impact is at the local level. And then the, the last question is, how will my vote reflect the biblical value of the family? As the family goes, so goes the nation. You've heard that before. We have a personal responsibility, and no one can help you build your family if you won't build it. It's also important that we acknowledge and encourage families from a corporate national perspective as well. It's important to uphold what the scripture says about family identity and encourage that in a culture and not try to redefine it. A government can be family friendly in a number of ways where it can be family unfriendly. But what do the platforms say? There are so many issues and so little time. So I say to you, do the research. 
there are probably 25 different party platform issues that you could be looking at and weighing. But in addition to the platforms, number three, evaluate a leader through people. There's a verse in the Old Testament that says this, can we find a man like this in whom is a divine spirit? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has informed you of all this, there is no one so wise and discerning as you are. Do you remember when we went through the life of Joseph in Genesis chapter 41? This pagan leader sought the counsel of a young man named Joseph who was a God follower. And in this amazing text, God moved that leader to get counsel from a man God had prepared. Pagan nations always fare better when the leaders, pagan or not, listen to people who listen to God. Joseph was just the first one. What about Daniel? What about Nathaniel or, or Nehemiah? What about Isaiah? If there's not a man or woman of God near a national leader, what chance does he or she really have to hear the kind of counsel that is what we call divine? Who will this leader surround himself with? Who will he listen to? Who will he give access to? While truth is certainly given to a person by revelation, it's even more frequently given to them by communication. It's a people question. The obvious other portion of this would be what kind of people will he appoint to key positions? The Supreme Court is always a big uh, people factor in every election. Those presidential appointments will serve for a lifetime, deciding key issues brought before them. Who will they be? Will these appointments protect the values we've just described, or will they dismantle them? People's choices are hugely important. But finally, number four, end this decision with peace. We're told to look for peace about decisions we make in the Bible. Paul said it like this in Philippians 4, Be anxious for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. Here's what I'll do. I'll read the platforms. I'll go to the polling booth. I'll draw the curtain and I'll pray. I'll make a selection based on how closely I believe these key questions will be answered biblically, knowing that I'm potentially influencing millions by my vote. But in the end, I'll walk away with the peace of knowing that the God I pray to is the one in ultimate control. You ought to pray that way as well. And when that election result is announced, that's the president I'll pray for. I'll work under that president for the next four years. I've got enough years under my belt to be able to say with experience, every presidential election is extremely important. But I can also say, God has given us grace and provision and protection through it all. The future is foreboding, but it always has been. So vote with a clear conscience, which always comes from aligning ourselves with the Lord and His truth, not from other sources. Faithfully represent biblical values. Then trust Him with the results. And then, after all is said and done, stay focused as a church on the life-changing, all-important mission of the gospel of Jesus. Votes can sometimes bring changes in systems, but the gospel brings changes in lives. And it's always the ultimate answer for a broken, hurting world. In fact, the gospel is the answer for you. Your hope is not in who becomes president in 2021. It wasn't in who's president of 2020 or any other year before that. Your hope is in who sits on the throne of your heart. And if Jesus doesn't sit on the throne of your heart, let me share with you. He wants to. He's died on the cross. He's been buried. He's risen again the third day just so you can be forgiven of your sin and be reconciled to him. And I invite you today to allow him to be Lord and Savior of your life. As every week we share that you can pray that prayer, you can invite Christ into your life, he can be your Lord and Savior and your Master with just a simple decision. In just a moment, I'm going to bow my head. I'm going to pray a prayer that would be a prayer you could pray if you want to put your faith and trust in Christ. You pray this to him, he'll hear you. And if you meet it in the sincerity of your heart, he'll forgive you. He'll give you the gift of eternal life. Join me in this prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. Thank you that his death secures my eternal life. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Give me this gift of eternal life. I ask you to be my Savior, and I also ask you to be my Lord. I turn away from all the things I've trusted in and away from my sin. And I choose today to give myself to you as my Savior and as my Lord. And I thank you for this gift of eternal life. 
And I ask this in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. So I want to thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, I'll be praying over the next few weeks for the things we've talked about today. Join us next week at 11 a.m. online where we dive into a new series called What is Truth? out of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. As we look at the truth today from God's Word, what do you need to reevaluate? Are we truly allowing God to shape what we believe? Then join us again next week. Remember that if you're joining us online, we're combining all of our services into one live broadcast at 11 a.m. We hope to see you there or at any of our campuses next Sunday. Find out more at crosscity.church and have a great week.